This presentation was part of the very first StreamFest event. The 14-hour live online event brought together live streamers from many parts of the world, everyone willing to share how they're using live video streaming to reach audiences. One technical note, for the first few minutes of the stream, there's some noise, a sort of pulsing. I've edited the audio a bit to minimize it, but it disappeared after a while. That's part of the joy of multi-participant live streaming. I hope you find our use of technology to teach woodturning entertaining and perhaps give you some ideas on how you might use live streaming in your own work. We join this session already in progress. Lauren and I live here in northern New Jersey, and uh, you know, we have full-time jobs. I tell people if we were full-time woodturners, we wouldn't be able to afford to have woodturning as a hobby. And we have demonstrated to most clubs within about a three or four hour drive from here. And um, it's impractical for us to travel the world to do say a two hour evening demonstration. So um, this is about how we teach people what we do, but remotely. And this is a way of us reaching audiences that are not currently being well served. And when I explain this to people, I've done this uh, uh, session to, uh, to we're turning groups and to demonstrators, and they need a couple of new skills because they're really skilled at uh, wood turning, but they're not skilled at audio, they're not skilled at handling cameras and things like that. So, uh, this then this session is really demonstrate it is really geared towards uh, people that want to be demonstrated, people that want to accept remote demonstrations, um, and in, in this particular case, anyone who wants to think about uh, teaching via live streaming. Uh, a lot of the live streaming sessions that we've seen and that I continue to see are live streamers who are streaming other people's events, whether they be uh, sporting events or church events or, or race car events. So you're there documenting what's going on. Well, in our case, we're, we're in effect the talent. We're, we're the ones that are, um, are presenting the information, and we're producing, and we're directing, and we're the cameraman. So it makes it a little, uh, little interesting. Now, this type of, of demonstration can be done uh, to a club venue. Say a, a wood training club has a monthly meeting. Uh, we can demonstrate to them uh, remotely. Or you could use this to do recorded demonstrations because the same mechanism that you use for live streaming uh, it lets you record. Or this could even be one-on-one -on -one, uh, lecturing or, or uh, mentoring, uh, whereby you have uh, uh, one person looking over the shoulder of somebody else. Uh, what we're going to be going through here today is an overview. It's not a recipe book. I want to give you an idea of what can be done, not necessarily how to do it. Um, just so that you understand why I'm, I'm so hot on this uh, remote demonstrations is it eliminates travel expenses and, and the logistics. Yes, it's sometimes difficult to do uh, an internet connection, but there's no more difficult than airline flights that get canceled or cars that get snowed in or all these other things that would keep a demonstrator and his or her tools from arriving at a venue at the same time. Um, the, uh, unlike some of the, uh, the club venues, we can do high definition content, both high definition video and audio. We can record the session. And one of the big paradigm shifts is that the demonstrator operates the cameras. We don't necessarily need someone at the club who knows how to, uh, how to work the cameras. Uh, these remote sessions can and usually are very interactive. It's, it's a, a two way video call. And being that we're working from my shop and say Lauren's studio, people are actually seeing our actual demonstrator shop and procedures. And most importantly, when the session is over, you can just turn out the lights. We don't have to uh, uh, dismantle all our equipment while somebody is, some custodian is waiting to uh, shut the door. Um, so I'm gonna do two types of uh, multi-camera demonstrations. One is going to be a little, pre-recorded video that I might talk over, I'm not sure. Um, it's gonna be pretty fast paced. 
my setup when you see the the live camera stuff after the the video which i think runs about five minutes um the uh my setup is artificially complicated I think I've got six or seven cameras hooked up to this uh, computer, this laptop computer, and if it doesn't blow up, I'll be very happy. Um, uh, but a typical demonstrator's setup would be very simple. It would be a notebook computer with a built-in webcam and maybe two other webcams. So um, uh, it's, uh, it really is important that you just get a, an idea of the scope of this. Yeah. This video contains selected clips from a typical two-hour demonstration about making wood turn jewelry. We usually do this via a two-way, real-time video call with the wood turning club. The audience can see and hear us. We can see and hear them, so it's quite interactive. So let's watch a bit of a session we did with a group in New Mexico. Let me uh, sort of introduce the two of us, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Lauren for uh, a couple of thoughts. We are best known probably for our jewelry and for um, things like shaving brushes. And I'll show you a little bit about, about the work because the more you sort of understand where we're going with this demonstration, the, the more the different techniques will start to make sense. I do not have wood paneling behind me. Uh, my my uh, actual shop looks like this. And so I, I don't know how many of you have a green screen behind your lathe. But uh, I find it very uh, handy to be able to uh, look at a particular camera and then I can actually put myself into any of the, uh, any of the pictures. Lauren is upstairs. I'm in the basement of our two-story home and Lauren is upstairs in her, uh, in her studio. Lauren, why don't you talk a little bit about your approach to wood turning and why you became a wood turner? Okay, well, my approach to wood turning is a little different than most. I've actually turned a, a couple of bowls, but I've never had a real desire to do that. I've made um, uh, vases and, and pens and stuff like that, but uh, my love is using the wood as canvas. I'm a painter. I, I love to paint and draw and and embellish and use all sorts of interesting materials. And I find that the less figured wood, like maple or, or uh, some of the other woods that don't have a lot of grain, are really terrific to embellish. I want to be as safe as possible. In our shop, whenever the lathe is turned on, Lauren and I have our full protective gear on, not just when we're sanding. You know, I understand that this is not the way most people are, but this is the way we are. If the lathe is on, the dust collector is on, and the um, and our respirator helmets are on. I think so. The more texture you get into it, the better it looks. So in this case, it's more is more. So the little dots enhanced the wood burning, and the ink enhanced the wood burning as well and it just all came together so you'll see when I start doing the other pendant uh, it starts out really simply and the more you add to it the more texture it has and it really looks good this was one that we did for the first state group in Delaware the one that she's going to do tonight will be kind of a, a hybrid between something like that and something like this she'll probably work in these colors so, Lauren, why don't you explain what you've got going there? Okay. I've got a little rig over here. Let's see if you can go out. It's portable, and I take it places. And I have a setup for doing the pendants. And then I have a little setup here for doing the brushes. So let's talk about some tools, some of which you may be familiar with, some of which may be a little new to you. The tool that I'm going to be using the most uh, today or tonight is a thing called a pendant backer plate. This attaches to the lathe on a threaded mandrel. So you'll see I've got the, uh, the pendant backer plate mounted on a mandrel into my lathe. I'm just gonna cut off a piece of tape. So I'm just running my, my uh, chisel towards the, uh, towards the headstock. Just trying to get rid of uh, of the
flats. Now, when people tell you that uh, carbide tools are just scrapers, well, yeah, if you're just scraping, but if you turn it up on edge, you're kind of using it like a skew. We're starting to add some color to it now, and I added a little bit of shading. I don't know how well you can see it, but it makes things pop a little bit. So there's some, I used a brush that has some gray, looks like that. So if I had a grid, you can just start making a design, you can add little crescents here, and it's all sort of repetitious. And I'm just putting these little lines in here, and all of a sudden my red is much richer. Lauren, do you find with the inks that you use, you have to wait for one to dry before you add the next one, or can it go on immediately? No, it's been going on immediately. Face shield down, dust collector on, spin it, make sure we're not losing it, and now I'm just working on the inside here. Just trying to thin it out a little bit. Again, the round tool makes pretty quick work of this. Oh, I can, I can see you. I just wanted to show uh, uh, the group all these uh, people with gray beards, like, like mine, <laughs> uh, uh, staring at a computer screen. It is absolutely compelling video. So jewelry is basically all about connections. So it's how you connect beads. There are a million different kinds of beads in every different kind of configuration um, and every material. And you can make your own beads. Uh, doing wood beads are really lovely. Yeah, so we, we need to wrap up. Thank you very much. We'll, okay. we'll send around all the resources to all our members. Okay. And uh, it's a wonderful presentation, very informative. Let's you know where to find us, and, and it's actually been a, a pleasure. Lauren? Yes, it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm sure after you've had a chance to try some of this stuff, you'll have lots of questions. Yeah, and, and, the, and you can send us info at zenreich.com. It's also on the, uh, on the resource sheet. So that gives you a, a little idea of... Uh, of the kinds of things that we do. Uh, I figured I'd throw another couple of uh, slides in uh, to show you that uh, we uh, do spheres. And this ink work doesn't only uh, work for uh, jewelry. Um, and so let's see here. Um, we have another one here, different examples of the uh, jewelry. and. I'm trying to breed 3D printers, so those are a couple of uh, 3D printers of mine. Um, so what you what you just seen is a way. Uh, actually, give me a second. I want to uh, think. Drop my uh, my volume down on this microphone. Let's try that. Oh, yeah, I think that's probably a little bit better. Um, so. There's a, a couple of things that uh, that we showed there. Uh, one is that this was all done with webcams. And let me uh, just come back here. Let's play that. And I'll come back in here. All right. So that was all done with webcams. Um, I tend to use uh, mostly webcams because they are uh, inexpensive. They're high definition and they focus very closely. Um, in my shop at the moment, I will I will show you uh, the type of gear, but uh, I'll show you just another couple of things that might just entertain some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, live streamers. And let me see if this will work. So if I uh, minimize myself and if I do this. And let's see if this works. This may be entertaining about the way that I'm going to start to present uh, videos. Hi there. My name is Lauren Zenreich. I'm an AAW member and a member of WIT, Women Interning. 
I've been turning for about six years so now. So taking an I animation like that and uh, putting the, uh, the video into it and Today, then saying, well, let's use the, the merge of a wood uh, transition this is my to merge lathe. up like that. It's so I thought that was kind of a, a cool thing to do. Lathe, so I can and, turn anything uh, up to 12 inches uh, into Giles diameter. actually helped with when uh, I bought it, it working came out with some of the, uh, the technical end of, of doing that. And so, um, so I suppose I can I can show you a little bit about what's in the shop. Um, let me do this. I'm going to switch to this camera. Um, what I've got here, I'm going to give you a, a very quick little tour. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see in the the inset picture, this is a little action camera. It's going over HDMI into a Magewell USB 3 adapter. So what we have is the lathe is here. We've got a notebook computer above the lathe. I've got a, uh, a monitor to the left and I, I use that um, mostly to uh, to use Zoom or something, uh, some other transport, uh, keep that in that monitor. I actually have another monitor in the other room where my assembly table is and that mirrors this, this computer here. Uh, you'll see why in a little while I've got uh, an iPad sitting next to the uh, to the screen. Uh, and let's take a look at let's count cameras though. I've got one uh, Logitech C925E over there. I've got a Logitech Brio over here. I have got a uh, C920 over here, and that's a that's a down camera. I've got a C930 that is sitting on. A, um, a microphone stand and the advantage of the microphone stand is that because these cameras are so lightweight I can put them on a flex arm and all of these are on quick releases so I can just snap them off and put it into place. Um, I've got over there, uh, you can probably just see it over here, I actually have a uh, an iPhone that's sitting on a pan and tilt mount and that's coming in via uh, NDI cam and just the other day I got this little camera which is a security camera but this one is a USB 2.0 1080p security camera and it doesn't have a uh, uh, it doesn't have a mount for it so I whipped it something temporarily with my 3d printer so that's uh, that's kind of fun now two things that are important to me is that I don't want to reach up here to the computer uh, to switch cameras. So what I've got is a, a little wireless keyboard, put the magnetic strips on the back, so it just attaches to my headstock. And because I really don't like using this little trackpad, I've got another trackpad here. So uh, the advantage of using this little keyboard is that I've got the keys set up so that, well, let's see what happens if I take this and put this into the inset. Let me put this into the inset. And so what I can do is I've got the keyboard set up so that the top row are the inputs that get put into the program window. So if I press the one key, if I press the one key, camera one, the down camera, gets put into the into the main window. Number two, the second camera. Number three, that's my, uh, that's me. Number four is the uh, Logitech Brio. Number five is the action camera. Uh, number six is the uh, little uh, uh, security camera with a verifocal lens on it and um, I'll show that in a second and number seven is actually the uh, the um, let's see if I can get this to actually work there we go come on you can do it there we go so this is on a little pan and uh, and uh, tilt mechanism which is a uh, kind of fun and it's using uh, uh, NDI uh, to to connect so 
those are the uh, those are the cameras that I've got. Obviously, I wouldn't use all the cameras all the time, but for this group here, I thought it was useful to uh, to uh, show you some of the toys. Now, on this camera here, on the well, I'll call this my main camera, my down camera. Typically, this is set for fixed focus. It's not set for automatic focus because as we move our hands in and out, I don't want the uh, the focus jumping from here down to the lathe bed or or up. Um, but this one here, the uh, uh, camera two, is set for close focus because I want to be able to come up like this and very quickly show uh, the bevel and how this thing was sharpened. And a quick tip is that uh, you want to put your hand up and block the background because otherwise the webcam is going to try to focus on the background. So this is a quick way of, uh, of getting it very sharp. Um, the uh, the verifocal is going to be kind of interesting. Uh, let me take out. Let me take out this one here. Uh, the verifocal is interesting because there are two um, two rings on it. Uh, to help if I use the right camera. Um, one is the zoom ring, and the other is the focus ring. So it's not a zoom lens, it's a verifocal lens. A zoom lens, as you change the focal length, it maintains focus. But this is a way of, of being able to come in closer. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the uh, let me put this one back here. All right, the first row puts things into the um, into the program window. The second row takes those same inputs, one, two, three, four, five, etc., and puts them into the inset. So I can change this. So if I went to, let's see, let me put this in the big one here. Oh, another thing I've done is I've, I've set the arrow keys that moves the active image left and right and up and down, which is very useful when you need to just get something out of the way of the inset. Um, so the second row puts things into the, uh, into the inset. And the third row down takes the, so you can think of the inputs, the, the columns as the, uh, as the input numbers and the rows as what they do. And so the, uh, the third one, the third row down, let me uh, put uh, camera one in here. The third row down does a 10% magnification. The fourth row down zooms out. By the way, if you ever zoom out and you go too far and you find yourself with your image upside down, uh, that's because you went too far and you just need to magnify it and bring it back to normal. Um, so I'm using the, uh, I'm using the keyboard as a camera switcher. Now I do have, uh, an X key controller that I haven't started playing with yet. And I won't be using those for, for keyboard. I won't be using those for camera control, but I will be using that to do things like, uh, uh, show particular videos and such. And the reason why I wanted a wireless controller is that I need to be able to go into the next room as, as you saw in the video where I was showing some of the tools. So that's in the next room. I literally take this little keyboard into the next room and I also have uh, an HDMI monitor in that room that's mirroring uh, the vMix on, the, uh, on the, the screen so that I can control the cameras. Lauren is coming in either via NDI or by vMix call so I'm taking her in because she's got a computer with uh, uh, three cameras uh, up in her studio. So this is actually uh, uh, kind of a nice, a nice setup. And let me just uh, move this back where it belongs. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's pretty handy. Um, let's see, what else did I want to show you here? 
Okay, my timing is pretty good. All right, so I, I just want to show you something something else here, um, and that is this other little feature. Uh, a friend called me, uh, one of the fellows I was mentoring for uh, for uh, teaching him how to do this kind of stuff, and he says, I want to be able to take uh, DVDs that I've already recorded and I want to be able to um, annotate them. In other words, he wants to he wants to annotate them live. I call it the director's cut, where you're uh, demonstrating to a group and you say, I want to show you how I make this cut. And um, uh, let me show you this video because I can show you in a video that which would take me a long time just to set up. But let me explain it as we're going along. And what he wanted to be able to do was to be able to point to things. And so uh, I will show you a, uh, a short video of how this is done. If I can just remember where I put the video. Uh, I renamed it. There it is. So I'll give this a shot. Let's bring up the brightness on this so you can see it. And this is going to be kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to use a program here that I'm not going to discuss very much right now because I really need to uh, to do a full tutorial on this. So I'll talk over this for a little bit. Uh, the the iPad now, is just being used as an extended monitor. If I come over here and I'm using a program called uh, Duet Display to that oh, this uh, is little driver do, runs on the computer and an app on the, uh, the, on iPad. the uh, iPad. So you'll see that it just becomes an extended monitor. screen. So I've got, this is my main monitor. This is monitor number one. Monitor number two is over here. And I can move the cursor to monitor number three over here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to... So you don't um, need to use an iPad with this. You, you can use any, any monitor. It just, it just gets it off of the main VMIX screen. Which is a screen capture program. And I'm actually just going to use the editor. Yeah, so I'm using the Snagit editor. And the nice thing about it is it uses sprites for things like arrows and circles. And the and editor like is that. now showing up on this screen here. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, start with a new image. And let's see, did my audio still there? Okay, I'm hearing little clicks. I'm going to do a new image. And um, it's going to be uh, 1280 by 720. I'm going to create that. And I'm actually going to make it a little bigger. So right after this is done, I'll like spend the, like another five minutes. And then I'm going to go back uh, over. Uh, just back with the slides to, to wrap up. But then we can open up for questions capture. and answers. And I think this is display three. Now, this wasn't a, uh, uh, a demo. This was just something me playing in the shop. The entire and I had hooked desktop. it up to uh, YouTube Live, to see the entire uh, rather desktop. Facebook so Live, and was just this. recording I'm it as I was going to, along. Um, go into position. And I'm going to zoom it. And I'm going to pan Now, the these techniques can be used uh, regardless of what program you're using. But the whole idea show. is you uh, you that. set up a uh, there. an editor, you put a color and behind it, you chroma key out the color, and then put it in as an overlay. And if I move my cursor to the other side, that's about right. So now what I'm going to do is much like I color keyed out the background in uh, uh, in for my own image, I'm going to come over here to uh, an arrow. And I'm going to draw an arrow here, like that. And then I'm going to go and color key out the green. I'm going to pick the green color like that. And I'm going to choose one of these presets here, like that. And now what I've got is an arrow. Whoops. Control Z. Uh, I've got an arrow that I can move around. So just see here. So if I were to take 
and play this, what I can do is I can take that arrow and draw the arrow here. So I can move the arrow around and then I can just click out of the area here and I can leave an arrow up. And this is uh, this should be useful um, for someone like uh, uh, my friend Mike, <clears throat> who wants to be able to uh, talk about um, uh, pre-recorded videos or so. And uh, I can also do things like, uh, let's just see if I take just a pen. What I can do here with the squiggle line here is I could just kind of like circle here if I want. And if I don't like that, I can just control Z out of it. And I've got the uh, cursor set up so that it shows the type of, uh, of uh, tool I'm being, is being used. So if I go back to using an arrow, um, I just click over here, uh, use an arrow. Uh, I really don't even need the arrow unless I want something big because I can just use the cursor, which is now in the shape of an arrow. But I can also do things like if I move this arrow down, I can also do things like uh, change the thickness of the arrow. I can change the head of the arrow. I can change the shadow and things like that. So this is sort of a, a basic functionality of what's called a telestrator. Um, much like uh, used in certain uh, sporting events and and such, and uh, so this way it's a, a pretty uh, pretty easy thing to do. And so all I'm doing here is I'm taking my cursor and moving it from this screen over to this screen, and you can actually see because that that cursor is the uh, uh, desktop capture <clears throat> is being overlaid on my current image. Um, I can just put this anywhere I want. Note I that you have to do a full desktop capture. You can't capture the, the app. Around. So I don't have to keep you try to capture the arrows, app. It doesn't but capture the, I can uh, if I want. the cursor. And um, so that's kind of a handy thing. All right. To be I able think to... that's enough of that. Let's, uh, let's uh, jump back to, to the slides and I might as well myself into the picture okay so as I mentioned our our uh, our demonstrations are kind of a worst case scenario for demonstrators we're two presenters at two physical different locations and we're doing kind of tag team teaching so I start off uh, and I show some stuff on the lathe and uh, maybe Lauren is in the picture in picture and then um, uh, when it's time for me to set up for my next uh, my next uh, work piece, I'll make her the large one, and I go picture in picture. So it's it's kind of like tagging to the to the next wrestler to get into the ring. Um, now, as you may have heard in the uh, in the video, uh, one of the audience members asked a question about how long it takes for the ink to dry. So this really is interactive. Even if we were there, if we were on their site, because we're working things that are typically two, three inches in diameter, they'd have to be looking at a monitor anyway. And as long as they're watching a TV screen, uh, I don't need to be in the room. So that's uh, one, of the, one of the compelling reasons. Um, so I think we looked at a couple of things already. Uh, we looked at the full screen camera switching. Uh, we looked at cl closed focus. Uh, we show how the, uh, the uh, quick releases can uh, let me move the cameras easily. Uh, we showed the picture in picture. We showed a pre-recorded video. We showed chroma key. Uh, you're looking at a PowerPoint. Uh, when Lauren and I were in that opening shot uh, next to each other, that was a, a title or a lower third. Um, uh, desktop sharing uh, was uh, was used to do the uh, uh, to do the uh, Telestrator. Uh, I didn't show that I've got a MIDI controller. Let me uh, show this really quickly. If I come over here, um, right over here, I've got a MIDI controller. And what this allows me to do is, um, let's see, this is five, this is five. All right, let's, 
let's look at the let's put this one in here so you can see it and if I come over here if I slide this up and down it will zoom in and out now remember I don't have optical zooms here um, so this is magnifying and you lose a, a bit of, uh, of uh, resolution, but very often it's useful just to come in really close for, for a few moments. Uh, I go back into the days before zoom lenses that if you wanted the image to be bigger, uh, you took three steps in closer to your subject. So because it's so easy for me to move cameras, whether it be uh, uh, moving uh, with a quick release from one mount to another mount, or being able to bend the uh, the gooseneck, uh, it makes it really easy for me to reposition cameras. But sometimes it's just really handy. And uh, the uh, the one over here, the last one here, uh, is just it says active. It will let me just change the position left and right, up and down, and zoom the active one. So that's uh, uh, that's pretty handy there. And now let me go back here and let me just uh, get that out of the way I can put me back in the way so really the the setups are are somewhat simple um, they don't have to be as complicated as mine the basic setup is a notebook computer with uh, the computers webcam and two additional webcams you want flat lighting and you can have a couple of uh, accessories like these remote keyboards and stuff. Um, so the basic setup, again, notebook computer, a couple of webcams and a microphone. And so I just point out a couple of these things. Uh, in fact, let me take myself out of the picture here. Uh, the, one of the reasons, uh, particularly on very modest uh, hardware, one of the reasons for using the internal camera is that some computers have only uh, two USB channels and uh, so if you want to plug in two webcams you typically don't plug two USB 2 high def webcams into one channel um, uh, but the uh, built-in uh, webcam is usually on its own channel uh, I happen not to use it because I've got enough channels kicking around uh, so we have one uh, one webcam per USB channel mounted with quick releases um, and one is on a uh, on a microphone stand and the reason I use a microphone stand is it makes it very easy to reposition it and it has a small base so I'm not kicking it it's not like having a tripod leg sticking out and uh, the microphone is is uh, kind of a, a touchy subject um, if I come and just come over here I use this little microphone and the reason I use it this is a headset so this clips on here the quality isn't quite as good as what I'm going on now uh, I mean this is a, a performance a performance uh, uh, microphone but the thing about this particular uh, Plantronics uh, W440 the, is the savvy W440 is that it has active noise cancellation and because I've got this respirator helmet on, this thing, it has air, it has uh, a hose and air is blowing across my face. So it's a positive pressure respirator. And so it's got air rushing across my face and I've got this dust collector on that's a two horsepower dust collector, sounds like a jet engine. And so this will actually let people understand me even under the face shield with the dust collector going on it winds up being sort of telephone quality when all the noise uh cancellation is in and it's much better when i raise the uh the face shield but as uh we, I, I talked about earlier in a session uh, this morning what you are saying is very often more important than what you are demonstrating uh, a couple of other little things this was the, the little remote i was using for the uh the pan and tilt um, rig and that's like a forty fifty dollar item uh, let me just uh, go back and we'll wrap up here so for some of the uh, 
the cool toys, I, I use an external monitor, a wireless keyboard, trackpad, mouse, MIDI controller. I use USB extension cords. Um, and if you really get geeky, then you can do the, uh, the chroma key stuff. You can use a camcorder or an action camera. By the way, when I'm using the action camera, what I'm typically doing is I've, I've got a shoulder mount, uh, which lets me uh, let it lets it track my body movement. I wouldn't use a, a head or a helmet mount because you could get seasick or <laughs> very easily with that. Um, but even with the shoulder mount, I use that very judiciously, and I cut a hole in my smock so that the uh, the camera uh, pokes out from from the protective clothing. Um, the iPhone is very 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 nice. One of the advantages of the iPhone is if you think about it, it is a high definition battery powered wireless camera that focuses to an inch and has a built-in light. So I can actually look inside hollow forms and vases or in, in a dark area. It's a remarkable tool. And although it's typically used wirelessly with a little fiddling around, you can get it hooked up uh, to uh, a wired network. And it's very important to have broad, even lighting, no spotty lighting. These cameras do very well in low light, but you don't want to overshoot the, uh, the dynamic range. So you saw the uh, thing about circles and arrows, and anybody who knows Alice's Restaurant knows the reference to that. And uh, so there's the chicken and egg thing. There are not a whole lot of clubs that are set up to receive demos, and there are not a whole lot of demonstrators that are set up to give demos. But there is a, uh, a dynamic that is happening. We are starting to reach critical mass. Um, I've mentored several people that are doing it, and there are several clubs that have started to receive it. Uh, but the tools and the techniques here are, um, are very important because what happens is people, I, I call them mere mortals, can get into remote demonstrations without having to buy a $30,000 TriCaster and $10,000 worth of cameras. You can do this with a notebook computer and a couple of webcams and a wonderful program like vMix or some of the other programs uh, uh, that are uh, open source or shareware. But vMix is, uh, is the one that I've settled on. Um, extraordinary bang for the buck. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. So. Uh, Questions, uh, Giles. Since uh, I'm not listening to the feed, if you can repeat any questions that might show up, that would be great. Alan, thank you. Um, okay. Um, I don't think we got any questions in the uh, in the text chat room. Does anybody on Zoom have any questions? I've stunned them into silence. <laughs> or, well, or they're I think napping. You must have covered, I think you covered the subject very thoroughly there, Alan, and um, perhaps, therefore, there are no questions to answer. <laughs> um, so um, I thought it was a very interesting way that you use uh, live streaming. And, um, you know, it's, it's certainly a very different use case. And um, I think. Uh, it, it's uh, very interesting to see what you've done. I think you've um, found interesting ways around problems to enable you to actually uh, um, show people what you're doing. In well, the big, the big detail. problem, so, at, as I mentioned this morning, was, uh, was the audio. The video is easy compared to the audio. Uh, trying to find something, I mean, a, a lot of demonstrators will simply just not wear a face shield or not turn on their dust collector. Because I say, well, if I do that, then people can't understand me. And I said, well, no, we, we can fix that. We can, we can look for something that uh, will be a solution to those things. So I, I spent at least as much time on that as on the, uh, um, as on the, uh, on the video stuff. And, um, you know, vMix call, and that was one of the reasons I upgraded my vMix. I'm now in the 4K version. But because I need uh, two vMix calls, one for Lauren and one for the audience. Um, and uh, the, uh, 
the audio gets a little funky because if you're trying to record in vmix and you're using say zoom uh as your transport uh instead of vmix call then uh your audio is going out to zoom's recording uh, uh and it's really out of sync with your uh with your video and then you have to sync them up later on in post um vmix call has simplified a lot of that and um uh, this is only the second time today that I, I've done a oh, third time a vmix to vmix call. In other words, I'm not using a, a web browser uh, uh, to take in an external vmix feed. Uh, so this makes it very easy for me to hear you and record you uh, just by turning on the audio on that input. So yeah, there, there are a couple of interesting uh, challenges and uh, uh, You'll notice I didn't turn my lathe on at all <laughs> because I'm, I'm not uh, geared up. I, I didn't want to put on my uh, smock and, and respirator and, and all of that uh, because this wasn't a demonstration about how to do wood turning. This was a demonstration about how I've got our set up, our rigs set up so that Indeed. we can teach this. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Jan asks, uh, how do you fund your investment in all that gear? And probably related as well, as it Rayon, um, apologies if I mispronounced your name, uh, says, good job, Mr. Woodturner. How do you get paid for demonstrations? Is what? it the clubs that pay you or an appearance fee? Yeah, there, there's two things. One is uh, the way I pay for it is that um, I managed to get hold of uh, Jan's uh, credit card number, and and so I, every, he'll be getting a bill very shortly. So, um, the as as I said, I'm I'm in it for the toys. Uh, this is a hobby for me, and um, I'm not trying to make money at wood turning. I mean, we do okay. Uh, we don't do a whole lot of marketing. Um, but I figure that uh, one day I will actually retire. And when I retire, um, the uh, wood turning will become a significant portion of our, of our income. And as far as how we get paid for, uh, for this, wood turning clubs are generally poor by design. They're volunteer clubs. They usually have low dues structure. I have one club that has about 300 members locally and another one that has about 30 members locally. The one that has a couple of hundred members brings in outside professional turners several times a year and they pay them for it. Um, the, uh, the other club uh, hasn't had a, uh, an outside turner in at least seven years. Uh, we're trying to change that. The problem is that it's expensive to bring in a, a turner. And it's not just the turner's fees, it's the logistics, it's the travel, it's the, the lodging, it's the, the, the food and all of that. But aside from the fact that the, that, the, uh, that the club can't afford it, I can't afford it. I can't afford to take off from my, my full-time job to travel to California to do a two-hour evening club demo. So... This allows me and Lauren and other uh, demonstrators who are starting to adopt this to, uh, to be able to do uh, global teaching. Um, uh, I have a friend who recently did one uh, to uh, demonstration and it, uh, to a group in England. And I taught him how to do this, and I, I kid with him because he, he'll be the first to tell you that he doesn't know anything about computers. And I, I say that uh, he uh, doesn't know which end of the computer to blow into to get it to play music. And the fact that he was able to do <laughs> this um, uh, is a testament that you, you don't have to be a techno geek to be able to do it. The other thing that was very cool is that a couple of months ago, he did two demonstrations in one evening. He did at seven o'clock in the evening, Eastern time, he did a two hour demonstration to a group in Georgia on the East Coast of the United States. And then at 10 o'clock Eastern time, seven o'clock Pacific time, he uh, uh, did a uh, two hour presentation to a group on the West Coast. So he used the time difference to his advantage. 
And that's the kind of thing that would be really difficult to do without doing it remotely. And the last thing is that um, we offer an optional talkback section. So a month or two after we do a demonstration, uh, if the club wants, Lauren and I can can do a little 20 minute or half hour session with them because now that they've had a chance to try what we've shown them, or now that they had a chance to think about what we've shown them, they have some questions, this is a, a, a good chance, kind of like what we do in the theater sometimes. After the performance, the actors will come out and people will ask them, you know, how you prepared for the role, et cetera, et cetera. So, so being able to follow up easily is, uh, is a, a really great benefit of doing these remote things. Oh, by the way, we, we typically don't discount our fee, um, which is a couple of hundred dollars. It's nothing, that, that, no wood turn is making any substantial money on this. But the big savings comes in that there's no prep time for the demonstrator to pack up all the tools and, and drive someplace and unload and all that. And there's no lodging expenses and travel expenses for the club. So it's just tremendous resource savings for both the uh, demonstrator and the audience um, without having to uh, to touch the actual base fee. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Alan. Um, that's been uh, an excellent insight into the way you use live streaming. Um, we will be in a couple of minutes going over to New Zealand. If, if anybody has any more questions for Alan, um, please post them in the chat room. I'm sure Alan will pick them up from there. Um, and um, once again, thank you, Alan. That was an excellent presentation. Okay, I'm signing off. Thank you.